Okay. So look at this matrix, okay? What am I doing? And this is just all made up. All I did was I imagined a set of sites, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and a set of species. Okay, this is like, this is going back to the last time I published a paper using these tools, which was right around when Mona got her master's degree, I think. Um, but this is, this is just to give you the real simple view. Now, first of all, I'm going to put this down. The species are the numbers and the sites are the letters. Yes. Yeah, sp species are in columns. Okay, can you check your sound and make sure you're, you're getting enough? Okay, so you can hear me okay? Good. So, first of all, I want to just look at this in terms of species richness. Something's wrong there. Oh, no, I see what I did. Oh, it's going one. So Take the row above. Okay. So notice that, let me make that bigger. Notice that my sites are pretty different in terms of their species richness. I've got one site that has nine, and I have other sites that have one. Okay? And so, right away I'm thinking, well, maybe that site with nine species and that site with six species are my priorities, because they're the richest sites. Okay? But then look at the species makeup of A and B. Look at the species that are in B. Okay, I'm going to highlight that. Maybe, as would do the very simplest of these analyses, maybe indeed we start with our richest site, because that essentially gets most of the work done to begin with. So, right away we've got nine of our 12 species covered. Again, this is the absolute simplest application of these ideas. But I want you to think about site A now. Site A adds no species. And so even though it's the second richest site in terms of representation of species, it doesn't give us anything. And th indeed, the third richest site also, which is site C, doesn't give us any new species. Okay? So, this is the idea of complementarity. We picked one site because it was the richest. That's not always the best decision, and that's why we use these algorithms to analyze these data. But we picked one site because it was richest, and notice that our second and third richest sites become irrelevant. If all we're caring about is getting each species in a reserve one time. Okay? Now, we've got these other sites. And here's where we start talking about complementarity. We don't care about richness anymore. We're trying to clean up after those initial nine species, we're saying, where do we get the last three? So you guys tell me what's the next site that we should add to our priority list. Thank you. So if we add site E, we get these two species. Okay? And now notice that we're left with sites that have one species. Okay? Which one should we choose? Thanks. Okay? So you got it. That's complementarity, and that's an optimization algorithm. Here's what you guys just did in your brains. You need the light on, please? No? Okay. What you did was to take number of sites, a 
we had one, two, three, and I'm going to include a four just for fun. And then you graph number of species. Okay? And that goes when I had 12 species. Okay? Six, three, nine. Okay? And so all you guys did was to say, with one site, what's the highest I can get? And so you picked site B, and you got the slope of this line as high as possible, as steep as possible. And then you said, in your brain, with one more site, what's the next highest slope that I can get? And so you picked site E, and you got us up to here. And then with that last site, you got us up to there. Any more sites we add, it's flat. So you used an algorithm that was maximizing representation of species in the smallest number of areas. Okay? If you strip all of these algorithms down to their simplest implementation, you'll probably get the same answer with such a simple data set. But the next question might be, what if land at site E is unbelievably expensive? Right? Maybe it's some hill in the most expensive neighborhood of Addis Ababa, and you're going to pay millions of dollars per hectare. And the whole rest of this costs nothing compared to that. Well, maybe what you would do is choose site F instead of site E, and you're going to lose one species, species 10. And so you end up at 11 species instead of 12. But my point is, this initial algorithm that you guys did in your head is pretty easy. It's very useful, because right away we saw that species richness is misleading as far as an indication of priority. Right? But also right away you need to see that there are other factors. It could be cost, it could be feasibility, it could be different stakeholders have different opinions or different ideas or different priorities. There are all sorts of things that can modify this really simple approach. If I had made the list of species more complicated, maybe I could have given you two sites that had these two species and then a mix of other species, and then you would have had a harder decision about choosing site E. Anyhow, I just wanted to give you kind of that little cartoon. And this is a good example to illustrate irreplaceability. So uh, basically, site 12 is an irreplaceable site because, uh, uh, sorry, site G is an irreplaceable site because uh, species 12 is only present in that site G. So that's one illustration, uh, one example of irreplaceability, uh, the irrepla irreplaceability criterion. Whereas site D is completely replaceable. Yes. Or site A or mm -hmm. C. Okay. And this is assuming that every species is equal. But what if one species is an endemic species, and another species is common across all of East Africa? Or what if one species is big and beautiful, like a pangolin? <laughs> or, you know, whatever. You may have different weights that you want to put on the species. Okay, so I gave you the idea of cost or feasibility as weights that you would put on the sites, but you can also put weights on the species. So that adding species whatever, seven, is more important than adding species six. And all of those will modify this basic, easy algorithm that you all did in your heads. Okay?